It was in this region, in the city of Mecca, in 570 A.D., that a boy was born into the Bani Hashem family of the Quraysh clan. He was named Mohammed, an ordinary child like any other child. Mohammed lost his father, Abdullah, and his mother, Amine, very early in childhood. He was raised first by his grandfather, Abdul Motaleb, and then by his uncle, Abu Taleb. It is believed that Mohammed was sent to a nomadic tribe to be raised according to his clan's tradition in the desert. Like this child, like these Bedouin children, the young orphan was carrying on responsibilities like other boys in the Bedouin tribes, looking after animals and performing other duties. Young Mohammed was looking after the animals on the hillside where two angels appeared in a golden cloud and took hold of him. With secret gestures, they reached to his chest and washed his heart from a golden goblet. This action placed in him the breath of God. Mohammed passed most of his youth here, close to the route which caravans took to carry the goods leaving Mecca for the north. The caravan traders of Mecca controlled the routes to the Mediterranean. It is believed that Mohammed, with his uncle Abu Taleb, a merchant, traveled along the caravan routes to the north and to Syria. Through the years, the caravan routes from Mecca led Mohammed out of the limits of the Arabian Peninsula into the Mediterranean, where at that time not only trade was spreading, but also the great ideas were at hand, the ideas of Christianity and monotheism, the startling doctrine of one and only God. Mohammed talked to rabbis, monks, and Christian merchants and learned about Christianity and of Hebrew doctrine and of the final day of judgment. In Mohammed's time, hermits lived in caves throughout the Hejaz. Later on, Muslim tradition would say that these Arab hermits foreshadowed what was to come. They were early followers of monotheism, which would become the true religion. At age 25, Mohammed was a young merchant whose wisdom and honesty had already won him the nickname Al Amin, the trustworthy. He was unlettered, but sophisticated. Hadija, a rich merchant widow, had heard of Mohammed. She asked his cooperation. Mohammed led her caravan to Syria and brought back goods to be sold in Mecca. Hadija heard admiration from the other and more experienced caravan members about him. Through a friend, Khadija proposed to marry the young Mohammed. She was 15 years older than he. Khadija became his wife. Thus, Mohammed gained an important position. But wealth and business could not satisfy his concern about religions. He seeks a deeper meaning for his society and God, the concept of Allah, the one and only. Mohammed felt the need to find solitude. Often, he climbed to a small cave amongst the rocks of Mount Hira, just north of Mecca, fasting and meditating in order to get close to his God. In the light of what he had learned, the old pagan idols of Arabia looked shameful. One night, in the middle of the month of Ramadan, the moment of revelation came. The archangel Gabriel appeared to Mohammed, a blinding vision of thunder and light that frightened him to his knees and said to him, recite. Mohammed heard the angel as commanding him three times, recite in the name of Allah who created man from a clot who teacheth man that which he knew not. Mohammed quietly replied, but I do not know how to recite. Mohammed, deeply troubled, in fear and trembling at his destiny, brought himself down out of the mountain. He questioned himself, would I be the same as one of those clairvoyants who finds lost animals? He returned home bewildered to his wife, who calmed him 
and was first to believe, Muhammad was to lead his people to the right path. For three years after this day, Muhammad returned to Mount Hira, and the revelation continued. It was clear to him that the voice was a messenger of Allah, the Supreme Being, the God of Jews and Christians, the creator of everything, the creator of stars and sky, mountains and seas, moon and heaven, and man, who must appear before Allah on the day of final judgment. At the time, the Kaaba was dedicated to many gods, the chief of which were the three in one, Alat Uzza Manat. Muhammad begins preaching to his people. Kaaba is a sacred house built by Abraham, the prophet of one God, the father of Jews, Arabs, and Christians. It must be cleansed of man-made idols. Punishment soon comes to those who have refused to hear the word of Allah. Those of you who worship these idols are pagans. A few close friends of the prophet understood this message. But more important, it went straight to the heart of the poor people, slaves, the laborers, and all the others who were humiliated by the class-conscious merchants of Mecca. Meccans are threatened. They react harshly. Muhammad has discredited their gods and called them pagans. And most of all, he has threatened their pocketbooks. Muhammad says, a moral life is a life which a man uses his wealth for a just cause, and the wealthy and powerful must give to the poor and oppressed. Man should not marry to more than four wives at the same time, and must treat them equally and respectfully. Women have the right to inherit property. The rich must pay taxes to the poor, and no one should lend money for profit making. The Meccans received these messages as threatening ideas. The merchants and the rich men of Mecca, whose great source of income was the Kaaba with its old idols, were afraid to lose their benefits. They decided to plot against Muhammad. Time and time again, openly, Muhammad and his followers were harassed. Meccans were afraid to kill Muhammad because of the powerful Quraysh clan who might revenge him. But the increasing harassment had threatened Muhammad's followers. In addition to these problems, now his wife, Khadija, dies. Muhammad gathered his followers quietly and told them to leave Mecca. They went and crossed the Red Sea to Abyssinia, where the Quraysh clan had been trading for many years. This was the first Muslim community outside the Arabian Peninsula. Lonely and sad, Muhammad prays to his God at Kaaba. Suddenly, the archangel Gabriel appeared again, took him up, gently placed him on the wing of a fabulous creature, among other angels, flew him to Jerusalem, and then lifted him up into the seventh heaven where Muhammad spoke to the past prophets, Abraham, Noah, Moses, and Jesus. The angels brought him back to Kaaba, where Muhammad proved the truth of messages of other prophets. But Mecca was busy plotting against Muhammad, and each tribe took part in the conspiracy to kill Muhammad and his followers. It was a time for yearly pilgrimage to Mecca. Yathrib, an oasis 200 miles to the north, had already heard of Muhammad's messages of brotherhood. They decided to send a delegation to Mecca as pilgrims, but secretly they must meet with Muhammad and invite him and his followers to their town. The delegation met with him secretly. Meccan conspirators became aware of these and set the time for action for the next day. But they were too late. Muhammad and his followers slipped away from Mecca. Under the veil of moonless night, mounting camels, they embarked for the oasis of Yatrib. This immigration, which is called in Arabic, Hijra, starts the first year of the Muslim calendar. 
It took Muhammad and his followers several days to reach the safety of Yathrib. They had traveled fast, avoiding the main caravan route and water wells. People of Yathrib were alerted of his coming. A small band of Muslim converts living at the oasis were waiting for him. When Muhammad arrived there, they shouted, he has come, he has come, tears staining their cheeks. They offered him their homes, but Muhammad said, God will guide my camel to a chosen spot. His camel stopped and kneeled near a small barn. Here, Muhammad, with his own hands, with help of his followers, built the world's first mosque. From then on, the oasis at Yathrib became known to the world as Medina Tal Nabi, city of the prophet, or simply Medina. Around the extraordinary personality of Muhammad, the small Muslim community began to flourish and became a political force. Muhammad marries and has children. The revelation continued and was written down. These revelations form the Quran, the Muslim holy book. Now the Quran sets the guidelines on the practical matters, such as taxes, trades, marriage, divorce, and military matters, and details how a Muslim should conduct his prayers. Allah commands Muhammad to make a war against non-believers. The first target was the annual caravan moving south from Damascus. A thousand camels full with goods. The Meccan merchants were forewarned of the Muslim plans, and they rushed in reinforcements to defend the caravan. At the walls of Badr, near the Red Sea coast, they surprised Muhammad's army of 300. Muhammad shouted, All who die today will enter paradise. Outnumbered three to one, the Muslims fought bravely and fiercefully and triumphed. A year later, at Mount Uhud, near Medina, the Meccans retaliated. History records 27 raids. Slowly, by treaty and skirmish, Muhammad converted the Bedouin tribes of the surrounding desert, mastering their swords to the cause of Islam. After almost two decades, Muhammad the prophet re-entered his native city, Mecca, now leading an army of 10,000. Mecca was surrendered without a fight. The prophet walked to the Kaaba, touched the black stone, and made the prescribed seven circuits. He ordered to smash the idols. He declared a general amnesty, and Meccan swore allegiance to the prophet of God. Mecca joins Islam, and Kaaba becomes the holy shrine of Islam. In respecting the Kaaba, Muhammad avoided hurting the feelings of his compatriots of Mecca. The old forms of pilgrimage were kept, but quietly changed. Within two years, much of Arabia was united under the banner of Islam. But the Prophet's mission was nearing its end. Back in Medina, he fell ill weakening in each passing day. And finally, on June 8th, 632, in the arms of his favorite wife, Aisha, Muhammad whispered his last devotions, then peacefully surrendered to Allah's will. Aisha's father, Abu Bakr, gave the news of his death. Men, may all those who knew Muhammad learn that he is dead. May all those who worship the God of Muhammad know that he is alive and immortal. The 
one and only God is the God of biblical tradition. Muslims believe in God, in what has been revealed in Abraham, in Ishmael, in Isaac, in Jacob, in what was given to Moses and Jesus, in what was given to the prophets on the part of the Lord. Mohammed always said that Abraham, Moses, and Jesus were his predecessors. The Quran is quite clear about Jesus by denying him a divine nature. It is this which divides Islam from Christianity with their faith in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, born of the Father at the beginning of the world. In effect, through the Quran, God says, God cannot be penetrated. He has no offspring. He has no father. None is equal to him. The Muslim community deeply believes that everything that is taking place is the divine will and is best for the community. Destiny, after all, is in the hands of Allah, and every Muslim will be fulfilled of his expectation by God, even if this fulfillment is deferred to the day of judgment. The way Muslims think of themselves and the way they interpret the meaning of life is the fact that human beings are created like everything else in the universe by force, which neither they understand nor control. Men come into existence and pass away not by their own choice and decision, but by an overwhelming power beyond their comprehension. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad is the servant and apostle of Allah. The profession of the faith. The first pillar of Islam means to believe that there is no God but the divine supreme creator of everything. The second pillar is prayer, which holds this community together by means of certain common gestures in their worship and turns men's minds towards their creator. Islam has fixed the number of daily prayers at five. Dawn, midday, afternoon, dusk, and evening. Prayers are said in bare feet, with the face turned to Mecca. But these prayers are said only after the compulsory rite of purification. There are no altars in the mosques. Its minarets and domes stand over empty spaces which hold the mystery of God. A niche indicates the direction of Mecca, and so of prayer. Sermons or readings from the Quran are given from the pulpit. Islam has no priests. Every believer is himself face to face with God. Anyone can lead prayer or preach, however little the community judges him to be worthy and able. As the center of prayer and the meeting place for the whole community, a mosque presupposes a city life all around it. And so a mosque built today in the heart of the city reminds us of what the prophet foresaw in the beginning. His word addressed to the people of the city, the tradesmen, craftsmen, and workers. The Bedouins were on the outside of this emerging Islam. The washing, which is called for before prayer, could not take place here where it is difficult to find water. It was only as an afterthought in the final surahs of the Quran that Islam authorized sand for the ritual of purification. And the nomad's prayer is often solitary. And it was these same Bedouins who assured the early success of Islam. The third pillar of Islam, unquestionably, is almsgiving. O oh, believer, give out in alms whatever is the best of your possessions. It is good to give alms by the light of day, 
but to give them in secret is better and brings greater forgiveness. Empty squares and empty streets. This is a town in Islam which is usually busy, but which we have arrived at during the month of Ramadan. The fourth pillar of Islam is this month of fasting. More faithfully observed than Lent in the Christian world. It requires the faithful to refrain from food and drink from dawn to dusk. In spirit of sacrifice and purification, and out of respect for this month, when the revelation came down to the earth for the first time. The fifth and last pillar of the faith is pilgrimage to Mecca, the holiest place of Islam. Here, the sense of community reaches its highest points with a really universal dimension. Looking at this crowd, so mixed in nationality, culture, and wealth, we have to put to ourselves a question. How has Islam kept this unity for 13 centuries? This belief in the soul of God, of whom Muhammad is the prophet. To Islam, it was Abraham who built the Kaaba and placed the first house for the true God. Some rites in this pilgrimage also carry the memory of Abraham. There is the night before reassembly of pilgrims at a place called Mazdelifa. The pebbles they are looking for will be thrown at three rocks tomorrow. For Islam, these rocks are the one where the devil stood and tried to persuade Abraham from giving his son for sacrifice. And these pebbles represent the ones Abraham threw at the devil to chase him away. Another ritual is connected with this portico which links to hills called Safa and Marba. The pagan Arabs made this portico the seat of mysterious natural forces. But these pilgrims we watch following the ritual of walking back and forth seven times bring back the memory of Agar, the reputed wife of Abraham, looking for water for her son Ishmael. It was at Mecca, on this hill of Arafat, which is now one of the final points in the pilgrimage of the faithful, where Mohammed, already sick, gave his last sermon in the year 632 of the Hejira. Men, listen to my words and weigh them in your hearts. I have fulfilled what was intended for me in this life and leave you a cause which is clear. You will take pains never to lose it, for it is the book of God and the law of his prophet. Listen to my words. Know that every Muslim is a brother to all the others. A faithful Muslim believes that the law of Islam is the essential of his religion. In Islam, law is more important even than theology. To understand Islam thoroughly, one must understand Islamic law. In Islam, the law of the Quran is virtually as important as the Quran itself. The religious law sets guidelines and governs the life of every believer. Violation of the Islamic laws is not only considered a commitment of a crime, but also is considered to be a sin. Quran sets the guidelines even in practical matters, such as trades, taxes, marriage, divorce, and military matters. In trading, for example, Quran forbids taking interest and prohibits any speculative transaction, any transaction that results in unjustified profit-making of one party. If a profit were made, it should be given to the needy. This doctrine is driven from a Quranic phrase, God will abolish interest and cause charity to increase. In the case of exchanging goods without using money, Quran sets two principles. First, the two goods to be exchanged must be equal in weight or quantity. And second, there must be no time delay in exchanging.
because it is possible that during the interval, the value of one good might fluctuate, and this may result in loss for one and profit for the other party. In tax matters, the Quran is very clear. As the third pillar of the faith, every believer has to pay zakat. Zakat is not a kind of tax that governments levy on the public, but it is an act of monetary worship. The Quran has generally mentioned zakat after prayer and has enjoined it as an important foundation of the divine religion, which has been the creed of the former prophets in all ages. The great moral and spiritual benefits that accrue from the institution of zakat for the Muslim society and mankind at large can become possible only if the payer practices it as an act of benevolence and worship and does not regard it as a mere tax. The Quran also gives guidelines for upgrading the women's status in the society. For instance, a man is permitted to marry up to only four wives at the same time but he must treat them equally, and women have the right to inherit property. In the case of divorce, Islam does not involve a complicated or a long procedure. The grounds for divorce in Islam, however, are more liberal than in the West. They are not limited to proven adultery or cruelly or long separation. The couple may apply for separation simply when they realize that they cannot live together happily for any reason. When divorce is completed, the wife has to wait a certain period of time after separation from her husband by death or divorce before she can remarry. This waiting is to determine whether she is pregnant from her ex-husband before she remarries and thereby guard against confusion of the paternity of the child, but also to give the woman an opportunity to relax and somewhat forget her former association. The Quran also sets guidelines for alimony. A divorced husband has to pay for the full maintenance of his divorced wife for the full waiting period. This period is four months and ten days for non-pregnant women, and in case of a pregnancy, until the child is born. In the case of custody of children, Islam prescribed that the mother who is not incapacitated by a mental, moral, or religious cause has the first right to custody of her child, boy or girl, until the child reaches the age of seven, when the right of custody reverts to the father. The father has to support the child until such time as he can manage by himself, if a boy, or gets married, if a girl. A girl does not have to earn her own living. Her support is the duty of her father, until she marries. The first result of this new Islam in the years after the conquest is the building of cities. Cities everywhere always bigger, always more of them. The Muslims from Arabia at the end of their long gallop across the desert set up miles of stone. With these men the old cities took on new life and new cities arose on the earth either replacing ancient capitals fallen into ruin or growing up where there was nothing before to create new and important centers of Islam's trade and defense. Damascus, Kufa, Basra, and Fustat, core of future Cairo. In the west, Cairo N, the first town to be followed by others. Fez, Tunis, Baghdad, they are either old cities which have come to life or new cities bursting with trade and politics and people's lives. It was in this climate of the Middle Ages that Islam reached its zenith. Baghdad, the capital of the Abbasid Caliphs, flourished in a sort of feverish pump. When today we think back to it, we can see that this was the high summer of Islam. The Abbasids, like the Umayyads they dethroned, were Arabs of the original stock descended from Abbas, an uncle of the Prophet. Baghdad on the Tigris, and not far from the ruins of Babylon, is today a modern city. Only its name and a few ruins remind us of its past history. The splendor of the Abbasids was on show with varying fortunes for five centuries, from 750 to 1258. The Abbasid period was characterized by intense activity in all branches of learning and of art. 
Baghdad, which had become the capital of world culture, gathered the best scholars, philosophers, and poets from the East with the encouragement of the great caliphs. We have all heard of Harun al-Rashid, the prince of the thousand and one nights. But there was also al Ma'mun, who lived at the time of the zenith of this culture and science. And the whole Muslim world was united. Abbasid science is Arab because it is written in Arabic and because the Arabs in creating Islam and the empire were wise enough to promote a renewed interest in the science of the ancient world. This is the University of Kuwait. Above the entrance are the words from the Quran. O Lord, may our knowledge increase. All Muslim universities, from the most modern to oldest and most glorious, keep fresh the memory of the great discoveries in science, in philosophy of the medieval Arab world. Not one student or teacher can forget that glorious moment in the Muslim history, when to be a Muslim meant to belong to the most advanced scientific, cultural, and technological society known to man. The West was able to profit best from the scientific discoveries of the Arab scholars. They were discoveries which revolutionized every aspect of science, from optics to chemistry, from mathematics to medicine and mechanics. So they were practical discoveries, also needed for the correct solution for technological problems. The Muslim world, for example, was a past master in manufacture of the complicated clocks and of gears of all sorts moved by the force of water or wind. Indeed, the windmills, which you can still see in the Mediterranean basin, from Spain all the way to Greece and Turkey, have probably come down to us from the high plateaus of Iran, or of Tibet by way of the Muslims. From Spain and Sicily, Arab thought, either theoretical or practical, soon won over a Europe which was very far from reaching a similar level of culture. At Salerno in southern Italy, or at Montpellier with its joyously preserved manuscripts, Arabic medicine established for centuries its domination over an astounded old world. This was the school of medicine which flourished under the famous Avicenna. Avicenna was the first man who was able to hit upon the difficult synthesis between Quran theology and the philosophy of the ancient classical world. This was in the 11th century. He elaborated the most important philosophical system of the time, which became known in the Western world too. Admiration for Aristotle and other Greek philosophers stopped where the word of God began. This word of God was written in the Quran and was to be interpreted sometimes in the liberal sense, but more often in a broad and indirect sense. It must be added that such philosophy needs an intellectual elite, which is able to interpret its own beliefs liberally and stand up to the opposition of theologians and bigots. Toleration was general. Official condemnations were rare. These verses of Omar Khayyam, the great Persian poet of the 12th century, are a proof. Why did our Creator, when He made the world and adorned it, then yield it up to the power of death? If the work was good, why slatter it? And if not good, who's the fault? The girdle which bounds our mortal world does not whisper where it begins, or how is its ending. On that matter, no person has spoken a word of truth, and no one knows our beginnings or our fate. These ideas, which would have led directly to the stake in Europe, arose from the ancient cultures, reawakened and invigorated by Islam. Islam did not only produce universal scholars like Avicenna or Al-Biruni, it contributed greatly to the flowering of Muslim figurative art, architecture, decoration, and painting. When you speak of Muslim architecture, you immediately speak of international art. 
This architecture arose in the same way from Islam's meeting with the old civilizations which surround her. Most of all, Persia and Byzantium. The Arabs found a way to assimilate this new world, which was emerging as the result of new needs of the faith and community life. And they made of it something until then unknown. The greatest invention of Muslim architecture was the mosque, the aesthetic value of which is based on three essential elements, courtyard, dome, and minaret. The relationship between the vertical minaret the horizontal body of the mosque and spherical dome suggested different and original interpretations of the Muslim artists depending on the places and times they lived in. The events of September 11, 2001 left an entire world speechless with horror. Long before any news report had identified the perpetrators of this heinous deed, Many Americans already assumed it was the work of extremist Islamic terrorists. How did a religion that preaches peace and tolerance become so entwined with violence in Western thinking? America's first public encounter with Islam began with the confrontational rhetoric of the black Muslim movement, the Nation of Islam. We're not American. We are people who formerly were Africans who were kidnapped and brought to America. Our forefathers weren't the pilgrims. We didn't land on Plymouth Rock. The rock was landed on us. Islam had arrived in America long before the racial turmoil of the 1950s and 60s. Millions of black slaves forcibly shipped to North America in the 18th and 19th centuries came from the largely Islamic nations of West Africa. Once they reached America's shores, they were stripped of their identities, heritage, and even their religion. I have to accept that we were completely cut off from our cult past culture, and that includes Islam. In 1930, Wali Farad, also known as Wallace Fard, created his own form of Islam in the poorer neighborhoods of Detroit. He claimed to be a prophet sent to help black Americans rediscover their heritage as both Africans and Muslims, and thus founded the Nation of Islam. Elijah Poole, the son of a Baptist minister, was one of Fard's earliest acolytes. When he came to Detroit, uh, within a few years, a uh, hard time during the Depression, he met uh, Mr. Farrar. He made such an impression on my father that he had my father as a willing and obedient servant till death. Poole changed his name to Elijah Muhammad and became the chief minister of the Nation of Islam. In 1934, he took over the organization and over the next three decades, gradually transformed it into a powerful political force. Huh. Yes, sir. But I represent to you God in person. Yes. One new member was Malcolm Little, whose part Egyptian mother had exposed him to Orthodox Islam in childhood. While an inmate at Norfolk State Prison in Massachusetts, Little became aware of Elijah Muhammad's movement. He was doing, I think, 11 or 14 year sentence when he heard my father. After joining the Nation of Islam in 1948, Malcolm Little adopted the last name of X as a rejection of what he termed his slave name. No, what was your name? Yes, sir. And why don't you now know what your name was then? Where did it go? Where did you lose it? Who took it? And how did he take it? After his release from prison in 1952, Malcolm X became the national spokesperson for the Nation of Islam, increasing membership and spreading Elijah Muhammad's word. But the ideology of the Nation of Islam cast the white man as the devil, a view not shared by Orthodox Islam, or even Malcolm X. Wrestling with his private beliefs and public role, 
Malcolm X was seen as a threat to the organization. In 1964, he was expelled. Not long after, he set off on what became his pivotal pilgrimage to Mecca. He was on the pilgrimage to, to Mecca that his eyes were really open. He looked around and he said, my goodness, you know, there are people with blonde hair and blue eyes and people with very dark skin. And, and he saw that Islam was a religion of people of all races and all nationalities. And that really sort of gave the lie to some of what he was being taught by Elijah Muhammad. Malcolm X returned from Mecca, preaching an enlightened view of Islam, what many today call traditional or global Islam. His charisma and his power as a personality was so great that all eyes were on him and he came to the truth of the separation between the nation of Islam and global Islam. And he did it in the public, he did it on stage, he did it on camera. But this philosophical stance displeased more conservative members of the Nation of Islam. In 1965, as he spoke before a meeting of the Organization for Afro-American Unity, Malcolm X was gunned down by a group who many believe were conspirators from within the Nation of Islam. Despite his death, however, Malcolm X's vision of Islam would continue to steer the movement. When Elijah Muhammad passed away in 1975, his son assumed a new leadership role. When the son, Wallace Dean Muhammad, took over the organization, he had already made that transition with Malcolm. And I told them, we are Muslims now, we are following the Quran. We should identify more clearly with Muslims all over the world. In 1976, W. Dean Muhammad changed the name of his father's movement to the world community of al-Islam in the West. And today, most African-American Muslims worship side by side with Muslims of all races and colors from every corner of the world. Some, however, rejected this reform and became followers of Louis Farrakhan's splinter group, which he also named Nation of Islam. But Americans were soon to be faced with more images of Muslims at odds with the West. This time, the flashpoint was Israel. From its birth in 1948, Israel has been the focus of a bitter territorial dispute. Many of its early opponents were not Muslims, but Palestinian Christians. In recent years, however, the conflict has taken on the qualities of a holy war. 1967. In the Six-Day War, Israel successfully crushed the military forces of the threatening Arab states. The victory would only escalate the tensions in the Middle East. Twelve years later, Americans would awaken to the fact that they too were targets of rage, this time from fundamentalist Muslims. In the wake of a popular rebellion against the U.S.-backed Shah of Iran, the Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini, a highly respected Shia cleric, returned from exile in France to establish a new Islamic government. The uh, Ayatollah's revolution, which symbolized the response of ordinary Iranians, was also a response to modernity itself. How far would the modern age impinge on and change traditional life in Iran? A lot of people felt there were too many changes taking place and too fast. Because it was seen as an ardent supporter of modernity at the expense of Islamic values, the U.S. was cast as the great Satan. In 1979, Iranian revolutionaries seized the American embassy in Tehran, holding its diplomatic personnel hostage for 444 days. In 1981, the forces of Islam turned against one of their own. Many Muslims were enraged that Egypt's president, Anwar Sadat, had signed a U.S. brokered peace treaty with Israel. But the soldiers who participated in Sadat's assassination were Islamic extremists intent on establishing a fundamentalist Islamic state in Egypt. 
In 1990 and 91, America became directly involved in the Middle East conflict, leading an international coalition against Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait in the Gulf War. Hussein's aggressive campaigns, however, had no connection with Islam. Saddam Hussein is far from an Islamic figure. He is a military dictator, he's a tyrant, he tortures, he, his citizens disappear. Uh, he's gassed uh, and killed uh, the Kurds up in the north, he's killed and bombarded the Shias in the south. Uh, but remember that he has a certain symbolic significance for the Arab world. Because people are giving a choice to themselves. Do we support a Muslim ruler, however bad? Or do we support America? which is attacking a Muslim ruler. In more than 50 years of Arab-Israeli conflict, the world has witnessed a multitude of atrocities committed in the name of Islam. Assassinations, hijackings, and more recently, suicide bombings. Now, of course, um, suicide in Islam is categorically forbidden to a Muslim. Uh, in theory, God gives life, only God can take life. Today, radical factions of Islam have honed in on the United States as a target of terrorism, culminating in the attacks of September 11, 2001. September 11 made Americans aware of the viciousness of the radical, violent fringe in Islam. But it also, paradoxically, made more Americans aware of the fact that there are Muslims who are their neighbors who care in the same way that they do. Muslims of the world are at a crossroads. How will they define their faith in the modern world? Hijackers, hostage takers, suicide bombers. These are the images many associate with Islam. But do these extremists represent the religion's true message? Even though people know that there are a lot of things that Christians have done, uh, they tend to talk about the teachings of Jesus as though that somehow represents Christianity, uh, not what Christians have actually done. And then they look at Islam and don't know what the Quran says or what Muhammad taught uh, through his sayings and actions, but see the behavior of extremists and think that represents Islam. It is understandable to fear those terrorists who claim to act in the name of Islam. However, nerve gas attacks in the Tokyo subway, IRA bombings in Britain, the carnage in Oklahoma City, these and other recent events show us that Islam holds no monopoly on terror. After the Oklahoma City bombing, we did get a letter in the mail uh, with a clipping about the bombing. And somebody had put a post-it note on it saying, look what your people have done. In the end, it turned out that a white American man was responsible, Tim McVeigh. So I guess they were right. It was one of my people who did it, because I'm American too. Islam is a dynamic religion that thrives in some of the most modern places on Earth and struggles in many of the most troubled. I feel that the saddest thing that has happened to Islam in the contemporary age is the Arab-Israeli conflict. Why? Because it has become, among so many people, impossible to attempt to talk about Islam, think about Islam, uh, engage Islam without immediately thinking about this one bloody conflict that won't go away. There's going to be a peace sooner or later, either by exhaustion or by attrition or by imposition. There'll be a peace. These different Muslim groups, the African Americans, the Pakistanis, the Egyptians, the Palestinians in America, all of us should be seeking opportunity to come together and um, have discussion of what Islam is for us in any part of the world and what Islam is for us in this democracy. Iraq is my birthplace. 
the government of Iraq took half of my family hostages and killed many of them. America gave me freedom and dignity. This is the land where I can worship God freely without fear, without intimidation, without the harassment of the secret uh, intelligence. And I love this country. And I am thankful to God who brought me here to this country and made me feel again that I'm a human. The biblical imperatives are pretty clear. The two greatest commandments are to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. And so the question becomes immediately, well, who is my neighbor? Well, surely Jesus wasn't saying only people who look like you and think like you and who worship exactly like you, but it, it's, it's clearly a reference to other human beings. It is in everybody's interest that our worlds do not collide, but rather reinforce each other because we all are hoping for the same thing. We all, be all believe basically in the same things. And when we think we don't, it's only because we have looked at each other as stereotypes, not as human beings.